electronically. So we're just doing a Google Doc. <laughs> <coughs> but I would ask you to open that link and hopefully people will participate. And then, uh, nope. I want this. And hopefully you can all see my screen. Yes. Okay. So this is based on a project that I started this semester that came out of both the EDI training I've been doing through both NAEP and AQ, as well as the um, disaggregated data analysis that several faculty participated in. I was one of those faculty members. So um, the title of the talk is Student Agency in Determining Their Grades or How I Decided to Torture Myself This Semester. So to start us off, it's what is student agency? Because this is one of those ed speak terms that not necessarily everybody knows the definition of. And it seems from the multiple links that I went to checking it out that the overall idea is that student agency gives students a voice and choice in the classroom. And the idea is that that voice and that choice builds their investment in the class. And so they will be more inclined to participate and gain more from the class than normal. And then the uh, more formal components that I found that are part of student agency is setting advantageous goals, initiating action towards those goals, reflecting on and regulating progress towards the goals and uh, it, the underlying belief that if you give students agency, that will actually enhance the agency rather than diminish it. So I'd like to start with the, um, and you can use that Google Doc to participate, but what do you see as the purpose of a syllabus in your classroom? And please unmute and join in. Something I'll share um, from the bat is, I often think about sort of syllabus as something we talk about within the first week of the class and sort of share to set things up. But in my experience, the syllabus tends to get a lot more helpful down the road. Like I think about the syllabus as a document to kind of look back to, like, hey, we agreed upon that. Here's something we all discussed at the beginning. Let's keep us moving forward. So it, it provides something to kind of center us if we start moving in different directions or questions that come up. So a guidance for the, just an overall guidance for the class and a way to provide um, structure. Yeah, so I think guidance and structure are two things, yeah, that, yeah. those are helpful um, components. So we have communicate class and course expectations, agreeing on the expectations for the course, opportunity to set the stage and opportunity to build community guidance and structure. Okay, so then for those of you who teach, how do you craft your syllabus? So for the longest time, when I would create a syllabus, it was I just took last time I taught it, copied it over, changed the dates, maybe tweak, tweaked a couple of things. But it wasn't really anything that I spent a lot of time and energy on. And then with uh, NAEP training and at the Alache conference that I went to, I found out how you can use the syllabus as a tool to build community within the classroom and to set a tone where you're supposed to be welcoming and supportive as opposed to the, the normal thing that I'm used to from my time at school as a student of, if you do this, this will be your punishment. And it's just a list of that. <laughs> So yeah, okay, Manuel brings in the 
counseling hat when he's constructing his yeah I'll just with add the calendar. To that. I do begin with the calendar specifically. I was having a conversation. Oh, this was Peter in one of the tight chats that we were having a conversation about um, withdrawal dates. That's just something from my counseling dates that I always, um, you know, students don't know this information, even though we think they know. Um, and so I make it very transparent um, in my syllabus, in my calendar. I, I put those dates on there, all the the last day that you can obtain an 80% drop, the last day you can obtain a 50% drop, the last day to withdraw, that's already embedded in my syllabus. And so I start with those important dates. I also put the midterm. This is when the midterm, the official midterm date is. And so they already have those specific dates. And then just for the sake of me being able to plan, sometimes I forget to include all the days off, if, especially on the face-to-face -face courses. And so it helps me guide how I'm going to build um, the structure of my class, knowing which days students are not going to be in class and things like that. So it, it's a good practice for me. It's worked well. Now, I'm curious if you find or if you worry. My concern is when I put in that that you can get money back, that that actually encourages students to withdraw. But that's because I teach a topic that most people only sign up for because they have to take the class not because no. they necessarily want to. <laughs> well, no, not at all. I mean, withdrawing, it's a very difficult decision for students to make. And it's just, if they were going to withdraw, um, I think they're gonna withdraw regardless whether you establish the date or not, right? Because they are probably talking to an advisor by then. And it's just upfront, right? This is, if you wanna try another week of class and see how it goes before you withdraw, it just makes it more transparent. And from a counseling perspective, it, it makes it an easier conversation once they already know. Oh, somebody likes your, your new syllabus template, Tyler. And I would just like to add to that comment that could you please do it in a Google doc instead of a Word doc? That's on the way, I'll say. Um, okay. <laughs> that's the next step is both Google Docs and HTML versions. Excellent. Thank you. Got it already. I'll send it to you. <laughs> and then um, I teach math. So we have a fairly standard set of assessments that we've been using in our field for about a thousand years. And uh, that is basically quizzes and exams. That is the foundation of the bulk of my assessments. And so I'm curious for those of you in other areas, how do you determine the assessments that you're gonna use? Anybody? Anybody feeling brave? <laughs> Okay, I'll jump in and talk instead of typing. Um, my assessment, I mean, I've taught a variety of different courses and that the, assess the assessment, first of all, is gonna be aligned to whatever my outcomes need to be, but then it would depend on, you know, what the focus is. So say for example, a web design class and web development, I'm gonna tie my assessment into actually building a project that incorporates the skills Whereas another class I'm teaching, you know, there might be more focus on vocabulary, which then my assessment might be more um, a definition text-based assessment. So it depends on what the outcomes are. So you're outcome driven. Yeah. Do you have a pool of assessment techniques that you use or how do you, how do you innovate? How do you decide to try something new? Where do you find out about that? Um, I, I think probably a lot of it stems from my own learning. How did I learn the topic that I'm teaching? How did I learn it the best? And typically I, I prefer a hands-on approach, but again, it depends on the topic that I'm teaching. But fortunately, a lot of the stuff I teach is hands-on. 
And then the last question to start us off is how do you build community in your classroom? And the reason I'm interested in this is because, as I said, I teach math, which means that I am automatically the enemy. I am the hurdle they have to get over to get their degree. Very few people sign up for Calc 2 just because they want to learn calculus. It's because it's required for their major. And so there's usually a little bit of antagonism or disconnect that, well, it ranges from a little bit to a whole lot, depending on the level I'm teaching at. And so I'm always curious how my colleagues build community in their classrooms. So what do you do to make the class feel like a whole unit and to make your students want to come, to make your students want to learn? What do you, what, tools do you use to do that? My experience is a little bit different, but um, so I teach in a ed leadership uh, graduate program. So a number of students come into the classroom with many of them we're finding our first generation college students and naturally first generation graduate students. So they come into the classroom with a lot of anxiety around graduate level writing and in particular, there's like this mindset I at least found from like the first semesters I taught it. It was sort of like, I just need to survive these papers. That was kind of this idea of, I just need to survive all the papers in graduate school. So what we started doing was instead saying, or what I started doing was instead integrating, like really talking about writing as a process, going through and saying, hey, so here are the rubrics we're using. I wanna break down so you know exactly what this means. And here's why but then also framing it as, here's what it's gonna look like for your first paper. You're going to have the opportunity to resubmit, but I also want you to know that this is how I'm going to approach your first paper. The amount of feedback you get on the first one is gonna be more significant than the last one. And then being able to show examples, not only of high quality papers, but the feedback that even these high quality papers received. Um, and I think too, just continuously reiterating the message of, I'm team you. I want you to be successful, like I'm with you, right? But so the, the goal is that you're not gonna just get through an assignment that you have something to say. And as a scholar, right, you get to hone your voice and, and it's not about just writing like me. So a lot of it is, is helping to say, here's why, here's why it's being graded this way. Here are the specific techniques I'm gonna talk about, passive versus active, that type of thing. Um, and one of the other elements that I integrated, I think within the last two years specifically around COVID because of how isolating it was, was to assemble writing trios where they actually had, this was non-evaluative, but they'd have groups that they'd meet with routinely before their papers do and then after. And it's specifically around them identifying goals that they have for this first paper, for this next paper. And they didn't have to submit anything, but they could say, oh, well, this first one, you know, I never want to outline. Well, for this one, I'm going to start outlining. Um, and so what I find is there's really only four check-ins with their trios, but these are people they typically haven't had a chance to connect with yet. Um, so it's a combination of you're all in it. There isn't going to be someone who's this perfect um, writer, uh, but that you're on this path and that you deserve to not just be like, berated each time you submit something. And that just means that I take a lot of care when I do comments and I tell them, you're gonna see a lot of red in your track changes this first time, that's normal. And I want you to know when you read it, I hope that you read it hearing me say, I care about you and I care about your writing. And that's where it comes from. But it takes a lot of work and I wouldn't be able to do that, I don't think to the extent if I was teaching six sections the same way. So I, again, I scale that accordingly. It's a discussion I have to have multiple times every semester when the students ask me, what do you want in my homework in, in a math class? And I'm like, well, let's talk about why you do homework. Mm -hmm. Like you're writing it for you, not mm -hmm. for me. It's creating a study aid. It's helping you solidify the ideas. And so simply writing an answer down is not going to help you. And so it is fun to try and convince them that the assignments aren't necessarily about making me happy. It's yeah. about learning the material. 
and that may be counter to what they've received in another class. So that's yeah. like, that's at the same time too, right? Yep. Oh, and that's, that's what we've been as students. I think that's what they've been conditioned to do for many years, right? From elementary, high school, right? You've been conditioned to just turn in assignments and, and sometimes without even thinking about what the yep. meaning of that assignment is. And so, yeah, we're struggling against that. And I put down a comment, um, Chris, just to follow up. And I know you do this, um, but my experience with math classes, even in, in college, especially I remember a finite math that I took in college <laughs> and learning about matrices and all the way through the class that I was learning this, I'm like, what the hell am I going to use this for? Why are they teaching me this? And I was learning the mechanics of it and I really didn't yeah. ever learn the application of it. So I always think however many ways you can connect it to them, right? And to their own goals, because like you said, yeah, they, they need it because they're going to take engineering or they're going to take pre-med classes or chemistry, you know, they need this type of class. If you can somehow connect it to their own goals. And that's why I said, sometimes it's, it is beneficial, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes of your class to learn about them, right? Because yeah. you can't connect it to them if you don't know them. Yeah. Well, let's, oops, are we gonna, hello? There we go. So the project that I am here to discuss, the goal was to build community within my classrooms, to raise awareness of the variety of experiences of those in my classes so that we aren't working in isolation, that we understand there's other people there with other needs and wants. I wanted to empower my students to be able to express their wants and needs. And I also wanted to raise awareness of the impacts of student demands on me because there's so many people, so many of my students who don't understand that I don't go to a website and find an exam and print it off. I have to write those exams. That takes time. And so when you want to do six retakes on an exam, you need to understand what you're asking from me when you do that. And the idea came from, I took AQ training over the summer with Kim Tarver and Don Munson. And it was about building an inclusive and collaborative environment in the classroom. And there were a lot of HIPs, which for those of you who don't know, is high impact processes, right? Did I get that right, Tyler? Sometimes they say practices. High impact practices. Okay. Um, this one that I chose, I chose because it struck fear deep down in my soul to even consider. And that is usually an indication that is an excellent opportunity to bust out of my box and learn something. So what I did was I let students work collaboratively to set the attendance policy and classroom behavioral expectations for the class. Uh, I started with the student code of conduct as non-negotiable. We have to live by the student code of conduct, but invited them to share other ideas. Um, determine what their grade would be based on by choosing what assessment methods they wanted and how they would be weighted at the end. Uh, there was a non-negotiable there for a cumulative final exam because that's an IAI requirement that they have a cumulative final exam in person worth 15% uh, of the grade. Uh, determine the late work and redo policies for the class. So they set their own guidelines. I had them tell me what their expectations from me were. When did they expect me to return their work? When did they expect me to answer their emails, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I asked them to determine what resources they wanted me to provide for them that uh, a way to determine just anecdotally what did we learn through this whole COVID experience about online resources that they liked and wanted to see? And so the process was I started with an email to send out to students explaining what the plan was and how it was going to be implemented. And then I sent that link to a whole bunch of people. And I, 
uh, Manuel, Tina, Tyler all participated in helping me smooth off the rough edges, make it friendly, clearly communicate what I was trying to communicate. Uh, I sent that email on both 1227 and 17 in case people had added in at the last minute to make sure everybody was aware of what was going on. And I gathered the supplies needed for the first day, which was giant post-it notes, regular post-it notes and markers. And so I wanted everybody to have the same color post-it note and the same color marker so that there was some anonymity in who was suggesting what, as opposed to opening themselves up with a target on their back. And the, can you see the welcome letter? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is the end result of all of that input. I also reached out to both Greg Robinson and John Long to find out what were the major complaints they would get from students about syllabi and classroom policies to make sure that those were specifically covered in this and found out that really the only universal thing is an attendance policy that they get upset about and a retake policy. So they, there's a little bit of a welcome and there is a, a link to a, full, a Google folder that I will share with all of you that has all of these documents in it for anybody who's interested. But it was, uh, this is, the motivation, you will have a voice in what this class looks like if you take the time to review the following. And so uh, attendance and classroom behavior, asking them to focus on what, what classes have they really enjoyed in the past? What made those classes enjoyable? Where did they feel they learned the most? What did they get the most use out of? And so we went through all of those things that I listed And they got the link to this as well so that they could make a copy and take notes on it and provide insights. And I also asked them how they wanted class to run. So were they, oh, did I just freeze? Am I, can you hear me? I can hear your voice, but don't see you moving if you are moving at the moment. Okay, well, as long as you can hear me, I'm good. Yeah. It's not the most pretty face that I, have frozen, but okay. It'll be on the recording for everybody to see. Yay. Um, also, how do you want a class to run? Because I was curious if they were interested in a flipped model, given their experience with videos and, and everything. I wanted them to have an opportunity to decide how the class would run. Nope, wrong button. Sorry, there we go. So I had all of this planning done, got it all going. And then the first week of classes got canceled and I regretted everything that I had already committed to with my students because we were in that Omicron surge, not sure if we were even gonna be in person to start and how the heck was I gonna run all of this if the freezing screen that you see now is the normal Zoom time that I have always experienced. But I committed, I got over my fear, decided to run with it. And on the first day of class, we hung up the post-it notes and handed out everything to the students and pulled up that email and asked them to go to town. And everybody sat there very quietly for about five minutes. And it took a while for me to be like, okay, look, if you don't say anything, then all we're gonna have is a cumulative final exam and it's gonna be hundred percent of your grade. <laughs> and that kind of scared them into actually putting some ideas up. Once the first two people got up, everybody else got into it. And interestingly enough, I'm sure it's not shocking to anyone, the one thing nobody wanted to hang suggestions on was their expectations of me. 
So I made sure to make a point of saying, I will not return anything to you until the last day of class, unless you put something up here. <laughs> and then I started getting some responses. And it was interesting because I found out that my students are way more strict than I am. They wanted an attendance policy that penalized people for missing. And I was just like, guys, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Come on. <laughs> So it was interesting, and I would have loved to have shown you the giant post-it notes, but since I'm still frozen, you're not going to see it. But I will take pictures and include it in that drive folder when this is done. Um, what worked, it was definitely the most active first day of class I've ever had. Instead of me just reading and pointing out syllabus policies to them, it was actively crafting it. Uh, students are communicating with me more than ever before from those classes because we had that that right off the bat I was listening to them and I was encouraging them to express their points of view. Uh, I found out what assessment students completely loathe and why and I don't think it's a big shock to anybody to find out that group projects is way up there on what they hate. And I feel that the students walked out with a very clear understanding of what was gonna be required and why, because as they were listing stuff up there for assessments, I had the advantage of having served, I'm currently serving on the math major panel for IAI. And so I was able to pull up documents going, okay, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. You want 80% of your grade to be at home homework, however, that's gonna jeopardize the transferability of this class. And so I was able to walk, walk them into something that uh, I believe IAI will accept because that's the syllabus I sent because the class I'm currently teaching is one of them up for review this semester. So it'll be interesting to hear what my colleagues on that panel have to say about this, this syllabus. And when it comes to the challenges of what I was trying to do, this is not something I would recommend doing if you have no experience teaching the course, because it is important, I think, to understand what students struggle with, where they struggle with, how the pacing needs to be. And we all know that the first time you teach a class, chaos can reign. <laughs> so, I would expect somebody to have experience with the course before trying to do this. Uh, the half capacity made it very easy to interact with each and every student. I'm not sure how it would work if I'd had 30 students in the room trying to do this. I'm not sure we would have been able to reach consensus on what was gonna happen. I also chose to do this in differential equations, which is one of the two highest level courses that we teach in the math department. And I'm not sure how well this would run if you tried to do it in say a, a developmental level class. There was a certain maturity and experience that I could assume with my students when you do this at this level. And so I could see there being struggles, maybe not quite as wide open as what I did as you move down the, the level of courses. And oh my God, is my grading load horrendous based on the choices that my students have made, but that's okay. I would also see trouble with this when there are accommodations. I, was, I lucked out that none of the students, and I'm doing this in two sections of the same class, and I had no students with accommodations. So I didn't have to worry about that while I was figuring out what was going on. I think the one, one of the biggest hurdles is the fact that we have to submit our syllabi to the Dean's office before the second class period meets. So if I wanted to do this with, as it is with only doing it in two sections, I was up until two in the morning constructing those syllabi and then I had to be back in at 9 a.m. the next day for my classes. And that's just, it's not doable over a wide range of classes, wide number, large number of classes with that, especially in areas like mine where we meet every day, there's not that gap day between classes that those three credit hour courses have. 
And then the one that happened this week, one email can utterly destroy your work and effort. I had wonderful interactions with my students. I was hearing from them regularly. We were working together. And then Dr. Sam blamed faculty for masking. And now I have students yelling at me because it's my fault they have to wear masks and calling me sheeple and the one who told me that God's gonna get me. So when administration feels perfectly fine throwing faculty under the bus for unpopular decisions, they need to understand the impact that can have on the efforts that we are trying to do. And it's seriously, I don't know how I'm gonna come back from that email. I really don't. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I don't know if I'm visible or not. Hopefully you can still hear me. We can still hear it, it's still frozen. Chris, with the camera, you might try hitting stop video for a second and then turning it back on to see if it catches up. Nope, cannot start video. I'm getting, I'm telling you, this is a, not a good system. <laughs> we can hear you well, so I think we're good to keep moving forward. Okay. If you're okay being heard and not seen for the moment. Oh yeah, I'm fine with that. I am going to oh, go away. Go away. And there's my share. And here is the Google Drive folder where I have included the slides from this presentation, the link to the session notes that everybody's been contributing to. Hang on one sec. There we go. And also a bunch of the other high impact practices that were provided in the AQ training that I did over the summer. So there is some wonderful activities in here to adjust your opening day, to try and create an environment where it's not just you reading the syllabus. Uh, I actually used one of these, which was, uh, Let's see if I can pull this up. Yes, okay. They called it the syllabus reconnaissance, where instead of you reading the syllabus to your students, you instead hand it out and you ask them to identify five things that are important and five things that they have questions about. So I did this in my statistics class and it was wonderful. We covered the entire syllabus. Oh. Is it still screen sharing? Hang on. Yes. I can't get it to there. Oh, there it is. Okay, stop share. And maybe my video will turn on eventually but nope, still not working. Um, the syllabus reconnaissance I found wonderful because we were able to actually cover everything that you would normally cover about the syllabus, but it was driven by the students. And you'd have people going, oh, wait, where did you see that? And then they're flipping through the pages. So I found that to be very useful. There's also one that I wanna try that, in, that deals with interviews. So you have the class interview you for 10 minutes to find out about who you are. And then they spend 10 minutes interviewing each other to find out who, that, who their classmates are. That one looks really fun to me too. I don't know, Kim, have you tried that one? That's my favorite one. And I had already been doing something similar to that. So I really loved that the AQ um, gave us like this template that was much beefier than what I do. You know, I was like, okay, so ask me anything. 
and you know just let it willy nilly. And the AQ was much, was more structure and purpose. So it's a really fun activity. So my my next question for everybody in the session is whether it's from training that you've participated in or practices that you've found to be effective in the classroom. But I would appreciate it if you could go into those notes and share ideas, because one of the things that I have found is that the best ideas come when you step outside of your silo and you deal with people who don't teach in your area so that you, you aren't doing the same, everybody doing the same thing with minor tweaks to it. And so if you have any interesting practices where you build community or you build engagement in your classroom, please unmute and share and type them in, preferably with references so that I don't have to create it from scratch. <laughs> Yes, reciprocal interview. And, and I have a copy of it in that shared drive folder if anybody's interested in looking at it. But who else has tried stuff in the classroom to build student agency or build community? Chris, can I pause real quick? There was a question in the chat for you as oh. well in terms of how you set things up from Ellen. I'm not sure if Ellen, if you're able to unmute and share or. Sorry. Yeah, so Chris, I was wondering, you said that you built uh, or you had the students build their syllabus, but you were teaching two sections of the same class. So Correct. did you did they come up with two different? Yes, they're completely different courses. Oh, my goodness. How do you keep that straight? Uh, every day in class, I'm like, OK, so what are we turning in this week? What are we doing? <laughs> so I. It, I actually think it helps with the community uh -huh. that I'm I'm also it's like we're constantly reiterating what's being done when how and yeah like I said I'm the stack of grading is incredibly intimidating uh, I've doubled the number of exams I have to write I have probably four times the amount of grading that I normally would do based on their choices but I figured it was worth a shot. Would you do it again? Or if you did it again, what would you do differently? Um, I will do it again. I don't know because of that hurdle of getting the syllabi turned in. That That is a huge dampening. The Honestly, the hardest part of the whole thing was the killer constructing a syllabi, two syllabi in an evening. That was what was hard. The rest of it, I can manage. <laughs> Chris, I wonder, I have an idea that may help with that um, because you said you had a, like a big notepad, right? That they would yes. post the, I wonder if that notepad could be organized into like four squares or maybe a notepad per um, area of interest in the syllabus. So for instance, one notepad for- That's what I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so it was one that was grading. For grading. Oh, gotcha. One for attendance policy. And then as every, after everybody slowed down in putting their ideas up, then I walked from sheet to sheet, shared what was up there. And then as a class, we voted. So like, if one person wanted one of the classes, about half of them wanted quizzes every week, the other half wanted to turn in homework. And so what's in the syllabus is that they have the option to take a quiz on Thursday. If they don't want to take the quiz on Thursday, they have to turn in the homework. If they miss class on Thursday, there's no makeups on the quizzes, so they have to turn the homework in to get the credit for those sections. And then it's a one week late with no penalty. So if they come in and they see the quiz and panic and decide they don't want to do it, or if they think they're going to be ready for the quiz, but then they chicken out, or if they're homesick, they aren't going to be penalized for that. They can 
they have till the next Thursday to turn that stuff in. I wonder if um, the other idea that comes to mind now is what you're doing with us here. What if you use Google Docs to do that same exercise? I thought in of the that. Class? I thought about doing that. Um, the you would need a computer classroom to do it because I have students that don't have access to a device other than the phone. And so having them try to type and contribute in a Google Doc while on a, on a phone, I, I, had ish, I had concerns about equity and access. I didn't want somebody feeling silenced or being unable to participate in it. So that, that was, I agree. And it would have been nice. I, I think that somebody like Kim would be able to do this where you're actually building next semester's syllabus at the end of this semester's class because of the cohort type deal in her area. Whereas I, if I'm teaching differential equations, I've got two different sections of Calc 3 that might be feeding it. I have high schools that might be fe feeding it. I have people who might've taken the last five years off from school sitting in there. So I can't really build it ahead of time. And then there's the idea that since this is not the culture, I was worried that student, I was thinking about doing it ahead of time just through D2L and participating, but I was worried that students who weren't checking their email would have no idea that was happening and wouldn't be able to participate. Yeah, you're right. So there's, I, I can see this being a much easier thing to do in like career tech or health professions where you have that group of students that moves through or human services where you or um, elementary education where you only have the one or two instructors that are teaching the larger departments and the service courses it's going to be a lot harder to do something like this regularly and consistently and equitably. But yes, I would love to have some ideas on how to, I, I, I think if I could get over that hurdle of, holy crap, I can't write all of this in two hours. <laughs> when it also makes me think of, this wouldn't necessarily be for you because you kind of, you fundamentally looked at it as like a, as, as an overhaul and co-constructing experience. If, if there was someone who was like, oh, I wanted, I'd like to engage in this co-construction, but I'm hesitant to do the full fledged, right, version. Yeah. It makes me think of, I know some folks at, to varying degrees of success, this can work. And it's something that I'm contemplating, but giving kind of more limiting the co-construction to point allocation on assignments. So if you know that there's a certain number of points and it, it can either be agreed upon as a group or what have you, but you're like, here are the assignments that we know you're going to, to do. Perhaps you may have anxiety around this particular type of assignment and you're not sure after we go through it. Well, then you have, you have, you get to choose how you want to allocate the points. So you might have someone where uh, a 15 page or, or like let's say eight to, eight to 10 page reflective assignment. Oh, well, I wanna wait that more because I feel more confident in my ability around that. Th there's different schools of thought related to it. Oh yeah. But it either, it allows them to lower the stakes for themselves in around certain ones. Again, I don't know, I'm, I'm of two minds about it, but I'm wondering if that may be like the joking, joking expression of baby's first co-construction <laughs> um, for folks who are hesitant because it's not the, it's not the, the, because what you're doing is, is just, it's radical, right? And acknowledging that it is radical and it's profound. Um, but this, it could also be another entry for folks who may be hesitant to take the plunge. Absolutely. And I would, I would, I originally wanted to do it in all of my classes this semester. And uh, yeah, I dialed that back pretty quick when I realized what was going on <laughs> and I chose differential equations to do it in because a it is the 
the more experienced students that are in that class. They are more focused as far as they're in a math class for a reason other than I need this to graduate. So there's already buy-in from the students that the class is important, but it, it was also, I don't know if I would have done this with a lower class. I would have probably started with just a late redo policy, attendance policy, and still walked in with the structure for the grading. Because that was really the hard part was trying to figure out who's going to take. It's like, okay, when am I going to be writing these exams, et cetera. Kim, I'm sorry, did you have a, a question? Yeah, I just have a comment that um, you, I, I want to compliment you because you took on like a huge part of this. Um, but just to encourage people to say, well, maybe you can just pull some sections or small pieces of it, which is what I sort of yeah. do. You know, I have to have a certain number. I have a certain number of exams because I have a certain number of units and I want to assess at the end of each of those. So, you know, I give them agency on, you know, when do you want the exam? Do you want the exam on Friday? Do you go out on, on Monday? Um, I give them some pieces that they can have agency over. And, and also with regard to some of the assignments, I give them choice, a lot of choice in how they want to achieve or demonstrate the objectives of that assignment. I, and, and in the beginning, they really hate it. But by the time, because I have my students for two years, I'm so lucky. By the time we get to um, their last semester, I'm like, so do you guys want to do this individually or as a group? Oh, we're going to do this as a group. Uh, we want groups. <laughs> we want it's hysterical because they hate group projects, like you said. But then at the end, they're like, we'd like to demonstrate this in teams. And, and they know exactly what I'm looking for. Um, so you don't just to encourage people who are listening. You don't have to like roll out the whole thing and surrender all. You can take some chunks and give them agency with those. And they do appreciate that. Absolutely. I, I'm just such a control freak in the classroom that I figured if I didn't let go of everything, I wouldn't be able to let go of anything. So this is wholly, the reason it was all in was because that's just who I am. I, I have to do that to figure out what's going to work and what isn't. I would also add that, yes, I, let me, at the end of the letter that I sent out, I gave them the uh, tentative, I listed all of the content that we have to cover based on IAI, the learning objectives from CurriculumNet, how that corresponds to the textbook and the amount of time estimated to cover it, and then had, ask them to think about how and when do you want me to assess these? So yes, it, I do think that, how do I? Uh, there it is. So yes, absolutely. You don't have to do it all at once. And yes, I, want, I tried to provide enough framework, but this is also based on where I was coming from, which is that like I said, math hasn't changed in, in several hundreds of years. And classrooms have been run the same for decades. And so it's like, okay, if I'm gonna do this, let's just do this. Let's hear what students want, what students have found works for them. And I did find it, in, like I said, they were a lot stricter and meaner than I normally am. They wanted harsh, attendance policies. They wanted punishment for people who took a late exam. I, I was pretty surprised at some of the stuff that went up. But yes, all, overall, I would say it was a very, very good process. I'm hoping I'll recover from that email and be able to build some trust back with my students. I don't know how, but I'm gonna try. Uh, I think it was a mix of both, Ellen. The question is, do you think they were wanting to set high standard for themselves or to punish their classmates? I do think that the, some of the attendance policies, 
Students said they needed an attendance policy to motivate them to come in on the days they felt like sleeping. And uh, they were also, they had similar concerns to me about shifting full on from total remote to total in-person. And so I think they wanted some, some strict guidelines to kind of force them back into that. But I also do think it's punishing classmates. I, I have never had so many students narc on their classmates as I have in the last year for cheating. They don't like it when they see somebody else getting away with something when they're putting the, the work in. And one of the first things I did when I first started teaching was I eliminated B's, C's, and D's from my grade scale. You either passed or you failed. And if you passed, you got an A. And I have never been slaughtered so bad in student evaluations than that. They wanted the A to mean something. So it is interesting when they, when you get to the motivations and you start getting those conversations in the classroom. They did back off of the attendance policy when I kept explaining that I had to be consistent. And in order to be consistent in a pandemic with an attendance policy would end up being too punitive. And so we bent and I agreed to email people who were not coming. So more work for me. Yay. If I could add to, to that sort of this cultural mindset, um, I use a, 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 it's a poem, I think, and it's called Don't Let Your Classmates Fail. And I, I'm try, I try to change their mindset and, and it takes time, but I try to explain to them that, you know, not one person in the co cohort might graduate to be the best PTA student from this cohort or from this program. But my goal is not to have one person be the best, but for all of them to be the best. Because when you go to a facility and you work there, if you have a bad reputation, the reputation is you're an ECC graduate. So every ECC graduate represents you, right? And so we kind of have this, this community that we're not gonna let the weakest link. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to address the weakest link and bring them up. So every one of you, I can look at every one of you and say, I'm comfortable having you treat me or somebody I love and care about because every ECC graduate meets that standard. And, and they, they don't all get there. You know, they still want to like that com competitive mindset, but as they, progress to becoming a professional and learning to treat their um, patients with unconditional positive regard, buying into their success, they start to realize that, you know, we're a community and the entire profession needs to meet these standards. And, and it's hard to do. I mean, I, and I, I have it posted in the classroom. So I'll, I'll like hit it sometimes when I'm walking around. Remember, if you see somebody struggling, you need to either help them or let me know, you know, talk to each other. How can I help you? What do you need? And, and I, we, don't, we certainly don't get there with all of them. But that all comes out of a, I had a mean girl, I'll, I'll say from in the definition of the movie, the mean girl. <laughs> um, I had a mean girl in my classroom and I didn't know it. And, and this student did a lot of damage to other students until she got checked. So yeah, who wrote com competition versus collaboration? Exactly. So yeah, that, that mindset is difficult because of that's our society, right? Yep, exactly. I also use that language, um, individualism versus collectivism. Thank you. I also had fun discussing with them that whether you have a take-home exam an in-class exam, open book, open note, or an in-class exam with nothing, you, you don't get the same exam. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we had some fun discussions on, on what happens with the, the three options there. 
that it wouldn't be it's not like you're going to have the same exam but you have unlimited time and resources to do it <laughs> so we did get to uh we did it was it was some very good very productive discussions and it was i do think that i did get a lot of buy-in on yeah. what is required from students and why it's required when i when i pulled up that iai document that that opened some eyes when it says clearly on there a uh, proper level of proctored work i had to explain to him that that means that you have to have at least half of that work is unproctored or we jeopardize our transferability now whether you agree with that philosophy or not is another story but that is the iai panels criteria right now and so it wasn't I, I was trying to explain to him that i don't do these things because i want to hurt you <laughs> well we are approaching the end does anybody have any closing comments to make one question i was going to ask chris and we can follow up separately on this if there's not time is i was curious if you're going to reapproach any of these at any point in the semester with the students um I mean, I wouldn't want to think about changing a policy midway through for a lot of reasons, including that even if it's challenging, there's some benefit to saying, hey, let's, this may be beneficial in the long run. But is there plans to kind of talk with students with almost the same questions, either at the end of the semester even? And also, I was curious if you share much of your experience with this with the students. Like, it's been really helpful to hear today for all of us how this was for you. Like, do you plan to share some of it? Hey, everybody in my class, here's how this has looked for me as the instructor doing this for the first time. Um, the my last, mind, I think that'd be beneficial if you haven't already. Um, the last 10 minutes of every Thursday, we revisit okay. all of our policies and everything in the syllabus. What do we want to change? What's working? What's not? Fortunately, one of the classes gave up on quizzes. Yeah. They decided that the homework was a better choice. That that cut my grading down a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, we we revisit regularly. Okay. because i as i told them at the start this was an experiment i had no idea how it was going to work mm -hmm. and that if they didn't keep talking to me i didn't want it to hurt them okay. in the end so they know that the one thing that is immovable is that cumulative final exam everything else i'm ready to meet them part way on the second part, I mean, do you share a lot of sort of your experience of the, oh, as the instructor, here's what this looks like for me? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they got to see the, the giant stack of grading I have this weekend yeah. on Thursday. <laughs> I said that if anybody was unhappy with the way class was running, that they could take solace in the fact that I was not going to enjoy my weekend. <laughs> I have two exams to grade and two to write. Mm -hmm. This is good to hear. And Kim type in the chat as well. Yeah, that, that's excellent to see, like keeping that conversation going and have it being a continual thing, which um, everybody's working collaboratively together. Well, thank you for sharing your well, stuff in that document. And I hope you got the link to the folder. If not, it should be available with the CETL, with the materials in CETL when everything gets posted. Well, hang in there, Chris. Congratulations. <laughs> it's it's inspirational, all the time and effort you've uh, put in. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, we are penalized in some way, right, for doing the right thing, right? Because students are telling you this is what they want, but what they want and what's effective, right? You saw it in the HIPs. Yes. Takes more time. Yes. Um, and, and we don't consider that. Our time is valuable, too, and, and it's... Sometimes when we do that for the sake of the students, we're also putting a lot more load on ourselves. Yes. Um, so um, we, we got to acknowledge that. And it would be a lot easier if the testing center was fully open. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's, it's been an interesting experience mm -hmm. and I plan on trying it again. And one of the reasons, another reason I chose 250 is that uh, I am part of that faculty cohort. And so I have past experience with this course to be able to compare success rates with and disaggregated success rates with this semester. So I'll be able to compare 
success rates in the two sections that set up two different courses, as well as compare back to the pre-pandemic time and my uh, summertime, because in mass summer tends to have very poor performance. And I'm wondering if there's things that I can pull from this the next time I teach it over the summer to guide my syllabus construction without taking the time to do it. Because, you know, eight weeks is eight weeks and I don't have an hour to spare in the summertime. Yeah. I mean, Chris, I'll be excited to follow up on those pieces because, I mean, looking at the what worked slide, what's so striking is that so many of those things are significant to students learning on a very foundational level. So like the second one, students are communicating with me more than ever. I mean, that's so important beyond just yes. students are asking for extension of those pieces. Um, students walk away with clear understanding of what's required and why. Like so many of those are so significant to all of the parts holistically of a course um, that it seems like that's just something to hold on to. Even if those things seem insignificant at moments, like those are really big bullet points. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, over, like I said, it, overall, it's it was a good experience. It's just, there are some institutional hurdles that need to be removed if it's gonna be built on or expanded. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much, Chris, again, for putting this together and for sharing this. Um, I've been saying this a lot this week, but this is very much a conversation this session, looking forward to like continuing and seeing how things grow and develop and connecting other people too. Um, so thanks again very, very much, Chris. And thank you for the work you do to organize things like this. I appreciate it. And the the rebuilt website that I now have linked so I don't have to email you every time going, how do I find Seedle? <laughs> it's there. It's in that email signature line. Um, 